Good afternoon, and my immense pleasure to welcome Pranaylal, our guest speaker for the evening, and all the distinguished members of the audience to today's illustrated talk. Geological events have shaped landscapes and climate, and these are critical to explaining why things exist the way they do. All events in history, including the rise and fall of all life forms, human civilizations and dynasties have been affected by deep natural history. <clears throat> in the talk today, Pranay will share our 4.5 billion years of years history of the subcontinent and show how they influenced and continue to shape our lives. He's a biochemist by training and works for a non-profit organization on public health. He has been a caricaturist for newspapers, an animator for an advertising agency, and an environmental campaigner. His first book, Indica, A Deep Natural History of the Indian Subcontinent, was published by Alan Lane in December 2016, which won the Best Nonfiction Debut Award at the Tata Lit Fest in Mumbai in 2017 the Best Book Award at the Delhi Book Fair 2017, and was named among the top 10 memorable books of the year by Amazon and the Hindus non-fiction list of 2017. And now, without much ado, let me invite Pranay to begin the talk. And ladies and gentlemen, may I please request everybody to switch off your mobiles. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know it's 4.30 and it's uh, Friday. I'm sure you've got better things to do, but thank you for coming. This is really heartwarming. Um, I'm going to take uh, 45 minutes to tell you the four and a half billion year history of how we got here and in, in a sense give you a very, very uh, wind-zipped version of uh, you know, everything that exists under our feet. Um, I'm not an expert. I'm a biochemist by training. I work in public health. But I think uh, I, as a child, I was immensely curious about why mountains existed in certain places or why rivers emanated from one place and traversed across the Indian subcontinent and you know, uh, got released in another part of the country. I'm going to talk about three things today. I'm, uh, my talk is going to be in three parts. The first is going to do that wind-zipped version of the four and a half billion year uh, evolution of the Earth and how we got here. The second part's going to be talking about a typical journey that I undertake. I'm going to take you to a place that is familiar to most of you because all of you have been very interested in monuments and historical spaces, so it's going to be a very uh, well-traversed part of the country. And the third thing is going to be a little more light-hearted and about, I'm going to show you some examples of how uh, Indian comics and magazines have represented dinosaurs. So let me begin very quickly uh, with uh, what I intend to tell you first. I'm going to, uh, for those of you who don't know, this is the book I wrote. It came out in December 2016, and Fuzzle, who's sitting right in the center of this row, is one of the key people to have coordinated this book. So thank you, Fuzzle. I deeply acknowledge your effort in getting the book in this shape, so really thank you. So four and a half billion years ago, just before that, um, the orbit of planets and the protoplanets and planetary bodies, as they were called at that time, I mean, nobody existed at that time to <laughs> name them, but you know, things that existed that spun around the, the sun, a very primordial sun, were, were not defined by a clear orbit. And the orbital paths were very erratic, and there were times when these planetary objects came and collided with one another. And the Earth and the Moon came to exist because of something that happened exactly 4.56 billion years ago. And what happened is a Mars-sized uh, planet came and collided with a very early, warm, and hot Earth. And it smashed into it, causing the greatest firework that the Earth has ever wit witnessed. Of course, there was nobody to, to record it, but we have enough evidence of this from several astronomical studies. What this did was, why, why is this crucial and why are we talking about this, is because 
you must have heard that the 23 and a half degree inclination that we have in our axis, right? Now this is the great moment when that inclination on our axis began. So our history teachers and our geography teachers and our, you know, none of our teachers actually told us why that had happened, right? No other planet, no other planetary body spins on an axis which is tilted. The Earth is 23 and a half degrees tilted on one side, right? So this is that event that lends that thing. The second thing that happened was that this cataclysmic event not only created the moon and the Earth, but it also gave something which was very unique to the Earth, which many, many other planetary bodies don't have. And that's a molten core. So a molten core is, a like, is like a, a nuclear reactor. It's got a nuclear fuel. It's got nickel and iron and manganese, which get heated and come out as lava and magma, because there is a churning that's happening in the bowels of the Earth. This is something that keeps Earth alive. The movement of landscapes, continents, land masses happens because of this churning that happens internally. And this is the engine, this is the energy that is critical to the Earth. The sun's energy is something that falls on just about every other planet. But this is the critical energy which is important for creating why landscapes and what other features happen naturally, and perhaps one of the key reasons why life exists on Earth. But there are several other smaller things that happen, which I'm going to tell you about. But this is something that happened four and a half billion years ago. But the Earth, even after it had formed, and the moon, which was still close to the, uh, to the surface of the Earth, this is about three and a half billion years ago, the Earth was still molten, and you had a very, very fractious landmass, and the earliest form of basalt was beginning to form. The oldest rocks that existed were basalt, and they don't, no longer exist. So you had parts which were still molten, and you had large meteors and asteroids colliding with the Earth. This caused an enrichment of new elements and new compounds onto the Earth. So from that primordial early hot ball, which looked a bit like this, you had introduction of new species of elements and compounds and materials that kept enriching the Earth. Basalt has a property of creating water. But we all now know that meteors also introduce water. So all the water that exists on the Earth was brought either by the, the action of the basalt or the volcanoes, and of course, the introduction of meteors. So when, when you look at the, the moon, for example, the pockmarks that you see, those pockmarks started to happen at the time, the same time that happened on the, uh, on, the, on the face of the Earth. The moon became a protective body for us. We don't have such cataclysmic collisions anymore. We did have one when, which wiped out the, the dinosaurs 68 million years ago, but we've not had something as massive since then. right? But something which is, which is very unique is this geological monument. Can we do away with the lights here, please? Is that possible? Because the images will come out better. So this looks like a tiger paw. It's in a place near Shivpuri in Madhya Pradesh. It's a completely flat terrain. If you were to drive towards it, this is a village called Dhala. Until 2008, geologists and geographers and anybody in that ilk had no understanding why this mountain or this flat plateau existed. And it looked very different from the surroundings. The soil around here is pretty yellow in color. It's a dull yellow orange color. But this plateau itself is maroon, deep maroon red. In, in, in a sense, it stands out because of its color and its flat top mesa-like uh, look. But in, it was in 2008 that they discovered that this was created because of this event. And this was created about 3.2 billion years ago. Now, what had happened was, because the Earth was molten, you remember the Earth is molten, and there's a meteorite that falls. Instead of puncturing the Earth or creating a crater, it actually raised it. So it became like a carbuncle, a furuncle, a boil. It got raised, right? So there are only two such uh, uh, features or geological landforms like this that exist. There's one in Russia. And there's one here from that period. So we now know 
that Earth was not only molten, but from the center of this plateau, we found, we found material that was possibly from that age, 3.2 to 3.1 billion <coughs> years old material. But this was also the time when the Earth, in some parts, had begun to cool. And while there was spewing of gases from volcanoes that were now trying to now <coughs> reduce their activity, the water had begun to deposit itself in craters and basins. Along the edges here was the time when new chemicals began to form. And the earliest life forms begin to emerge. The first cells must have started to emerge in several parts of the world. There would have been no single place where the evolution would have taken place. That's because evolution itself, the emergence of life itself, was a massive accident. So it would have started, failed, started, failed, started, and failed. We find bio, bio molecules of which resemble life from several, several planetary bodies. Uh, the day before yesterday, a meteor has, they have found traces of biomolecules that look like lipids. Lipids are basic fat cells. And they are the first things that a cell need to have around them in the form of cell wall. Now that is possible if you, if you have UV light, if you have the right amount of carbon, hydrogen, uh, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. If all of these are there in the right quantity, in the right proportions, in the presence of UV light, you get the basic lipids. So the cell wall, the basic bilayer in which cells need to be created were formed at this time. And we now have evidence from meteors as well that such existence was possible. So this is an example of how the Earth in places where the lava flows were still happening, and something that we had seen 68 million years ago when the Deccan was happening. You see this still in parts of Russia, Hawaii, Iceland, for example, where you still have extremely violent volcanic activity under the sea and also on the surface of the land. These are called fire fountains and, and are very, very pretty to look at, but extremely hot, so people can't go very close to them. What this was doing was it was churning again the heat, and this, as new material came in, it was getting recooked. It's the process of recooking and reintroduction of material from the depths of the earth that makes the world exciting. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that not all the material and the minerals that we see today were introduced at one go. There has been an evolution of minerals which we have not understood yet. And it's a concept that has happened as, a, as, a, as, a, as has been introduced by geologists only very recently. I want to show this picture to you. This is from the Aravalis in, in, uh, uh, taken in Faridabad by this photographer called Mayur Shah. Now, this is a large rock. It must, must be about 8 to 10 feet wide. What it's trying to show you is a cross section. It's been cut through. And you see that in the, in the center, you've got the heavy met, uh, minerals. You've got, the, you've got iron and manganese as a form of a coagulation. And you've got, around it, the lighter minerals that are floating outwards. You've got lighter forms of iron here. And you've got a denser iron compound in the center. Now, the beauty of minerals and the way the rocks are formed, it's quite like the experiments that we used to do when we were playing in chemistry labs. You know, you remember the time when we had filter paper, and we would fool around when the teacher was not looking. We would take certain dyes and chemicals and put them in the center, then put another chemical on top of it and let it run. And then you have these beautiful, extremely gorgeous looking uh, designs, which were concentric in nature. This is exactly what's happening to the rock as well. You've got a series of cooking and recooking processes that have happened to this, this rock, which is called a quartzite. This was a, about a 3 billion year old uh, sedimentary rock, a sandstone, which got heated. But during the process of heating, the iron got concentrated in the center. But then it got heated again. It started to disperse outwards. So you had two layers of, or three different layers of minerals that got concentrated at varying, varying distance from the center. So you've got one core here, and you've got one core here, and there would be several others. But it looks like a filter paper. So there's, there's beauty in rocks, no matter how you see them. The fourth phase that was important was the, the time when the microbes began to colonize the place where, at the margin 
of their land met water. And this is a very, very important phase in our life because until now there was very little free oxygen. This creature is actually a collection of creatures. It's a single-celled organism in partnership with another single-celled organism. This complete fossil is about three billion year old. It's from Sonbhadra. In, it's a little east of uh, Banaras. It's a very beautiful patch of forest there called the Sonbhadra Reserve Forest. It starts from here like a concentric uh, uh, organism which started to build around a nodule of phosphate. Now, what it did was it would grow over, one colony would grow over the other. And the, the parent colony would become a substrate for the other to grow upon. So it would feed the, its children, or in that sense. You know, they, the next generation was fed by the, by the ones that existed previously. Unfortunately, this whole fossil bed of about a few square kilometers does not exist anymore. So we've got about 10 or 12 fossils. I own one of them, thankfully. But all of this has been pulverized to make toothpaste. So you know, the oldest creatures in the world, like stromatolites, are very good indication of phosphorus. And uh, no matter where you go, if you go to, say, Udaipur, there's Jhamar Kotra. Of course, that phosphate is being used to make fertilizer. This is food grade phosphate, so they make it, they use it for making um, toothpaste. So what stromatolites did, uh, from, uh, starting from 3.2 billion years till about uh, 800 million years, was add so much oxygen to the earth that it caused three major uh, ice, um, ice ages. And the ice ages were not freezing just the Arctic and Antarctic. There was no Arctic or Antarctic at this time. It was just land masses that were coagulated together, but it created enough opportunity for these creatures to produce so much oxygen that it froze the Earth. And it froze it from the pole to the center. So the, uh, the, the Earth from space would have looked like a golf ball, completely covered by ice. And what it would have needed was a massive volcanic activity under the sea that would cause the defreezing of the Earth. And for millions and millions of years, this cycle of freezing and defreezing happened. Remember, there is no macro life as yet. There are no uh, cellular animals bigger than a single-celled animal. Right? There are no two-celled animal or a sponge or a <coughs> jellyfish or a fish. It's still two and a half billion years away. So for two and a half billion years, you had these creatures dominating all life forms. But there were varieties of these guys. <laughs> They, they, in India, we have at least 18 known uh, varieties of this fossil called the stromatolite. We have, we have 80 different types. And they're beautiful. If you were to go to uh, Shakti Sthal, for example, there is a wonderful example from Odisha. It's a beautiful pink colored rock. I don't know how often have you been to uh, Shakti Sthal. They're shaped uh, like uh, creatures. They've been shaped out of that rock. And they're gorgeous pink color. It's like the pink color. Uh, of the Sadaji standing there in the corner, it's that pink color, and it's got rosettes on it. So they were, you know, so it's, it's that light, it's beautiful, it's gulabi, you know? Okay, so I'm now going to tell, uh, take you now to our modern times. This is a common scene, right? Now this is not geological. The reason why I bring this up is because Earth's chemicals were defined by geological processes or astronomical processes. And they, later, by biomediation, that means oxygen added by uh, organisms that produced all the oxygen. So basically, we've had four clear life cycles of how minerals have got here. The reason why I'm laboring on this is because if we understand this bait, we understand what's going wrong in terms of the ecology. And I'm just going to uh, take you through once more that when the uh, Earth was forming for the first time, I mean, the the Earth, molten Earth, four and a half billion years ago, we had about 350 minerals. But about two billion years later, when it started to cool and the meteors were still hitting uh, the Earth, we had an addition of another you know, uh, 150 or uh, 1,150 minerals. We had a total of 1,500 minerals. But when the oxygen came in, with stromatolites adding oxygen and it's freezing, and it's again defreezing with uh, the action of volcanoes and again freezing, there was a huge variety of new oxides, right? So if there was copper on the surface, there would be copper sulfate or copper sulfide. But once you have more oxygen, you have cuprous oxide, you have cupric oxide. 
you know, for, for the chemists, this, or, or even for the geologists, or for that matter, even for life scientists, this is the point, this is the, the phase in which all life begins to come alive. But in the last 250 years, we've seen a massive introduction of new chemicals, many of which are not even tested. I mean, they're unknown to, to ecology or to, to life forms. And as we leave them behind, they accumulate on the surface, and they go deep into the oceans, disrupting ecosystems. So the real challenge just now is not the volcano that's going to bellow a lot of ash in the air or change the climate, which is only a single spike for a very short time, but it is the adaptive ability of the microbes and the plants and all the ecosystem, uh, uh, all the creatures that serve the ecosystem that will have to, uh, to survive these new chemicals which they're not uh, adapted to. This is, to my mind, the biggest challenge that we are going to face. How are we going to get rid of so many new chemicals that are going to accumulate into the ecosystems? That's a challenge, and we need to plan for this as well. I'm going to take a 300 million year life cycle to understand how we got here as India, as a subcontinent. Now, let's start from the very beginning. Now, there is no Arctic. There is Antarctica on the bottom. Antarctica, as you know, is a very, sea, is a, is a, is a very large continent. And it was, about 290 million years ago, covered with, with ice. India is sandwiched here between Antarctica. And if you were in Calcutta, you could walk across and watch your test match in Perth. It was right here. And if you wanted to go to South Africa, if you were in, 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 in Trivandrum and you wanted to go to Cape Town to Newlands to watch another test match, you could walk across. But you know, think about it. India is under ice. There's no cricket. And, but you know, you could play cricket only in, in, in New Zealand, oh, sorry, in, in Greenland, because Greenland is a tropical paradise. Right? So Greenland remains up there with you know, all the gorgeous you know, forests and everything that it has to hold. But this is the time when the Earth has all come together. And this, only the southern bits are the ones that are covered with near perpetual ice. But something else happens. About in, in, in a period of 30 million years, the Earth begins to warm. There were volcanoes here in Russia and China, which were beginning to uh, release hot volcanic gases. And there were some uh, volcanoes here in the uh, American subcontinent uh, that had started to release uh, gases, which melted all the ice. It, it warmed the entire Earth. And now India, as you notice, has got liberated of its ice. And this is the kind of forest that would have existed at the time. What is unique about this forest is these lycopods, these very tall telegraph pole-like uh, plants, uh, about eight meters in height, lived in swampy <laughs> conditions. You had tree ferns, uh, you know, the ones that we have outside, which everybody calls palm, which it is not a palm. And here, here's a tree fern. There's a cycad here, which is uh, another very uh, beautiful uh, plant. You've got horsetails here, which are somehow, you know, only found in New Zealand and parts of other uh, some other wet uh, microcontinents of the world. The beauty of this picture is that it was this that created all the petrol and all the coal that we have in the Gondwana side of the world. So the, the, the coal that is made in Jharia or in the Sayadri was made between this period, between 290 million and 255 million. The repeated submergence of vegetation that existed in these shallow watery conditions is the one that determined that the coal and the, and the petrol reserves of India were created at this time. Not just India, South Africa, Brazil, Antarctica, Australia. So what this, Middle East? so Middle East is much later, it's later Jurassic, so. So I'll come to that, you, you see, because this cycle of, of burying of vegetation is important from the perspective of climate change. The reason why I bring this up is because the ice melted, there's enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, causes the release of uh, you know, the ice, and you have you know, up, upwelling of such uh, lush vegetation. It is the submergence in shallow lakes is the time at which creates the coal reserves. So if, you were to, if anybody's grown up here uh, in, in a place like, say, Dhanbad or Jharia, or if you have ever been there, you would notice that you have thick coal seams, but you have a thin layer of mud in between. 
And if you were to look at that mud carefully, you would notice that it is very silica rich, and you find tiny shells in them as well. Right? The creatures that lived at this time were very, very unique. You had a crocodile-like creature, which is this called the Chasmatosaurus. And you had the, the, the dominating creature of the land was a very unusual creature. It was this creature called the Lystrosaurus. Now, you remember the image that I'd shown you here. So Lystrosaurus would walk from here, and they would go into annual hibernation, hibernations like this. Okay, They would go like this across. Lystrosaurus was not found in these continents. They were found uniquely here in our part of the world, in India, Brazil, South Africa, and, and Australia. We now, I mean, this is a way to identify that fossils also tell us where the lands were, other than the rocks themselves. But let's come back here, because this is, this is very important for us. The dominant creature was the Lystrosaurus. The Lystrosaurus was the ancestor of the modern frog. This creature was about the size of your Maruti 800. Think about it. This is the time which was ruled by the frogs. Not mammals, not dinosaurs, not reptiles. The reptiles were largely in water, like this chasmatosaurus. Most reptiles have not changed their form since they have evolved. So for example, crocodiles are, have, have, have found no need to change their, their design because they are nearly perfect. They can survive salt water. They can, move, they can live in fast-flowing cold waters. They can live in tropical waters. They're happy with all of them. And they do um, uh, large marine um, journeys as well. I mean, saltwater crocodiles, for example. So they're suited for several things. This is a pure reptile, which used to live on land. But what is of true interest to us, being humans, being mammals, is this creature. Our ancestors were basically something like this creature called the mammal-like reptile. This is called Thrinexodon. If you, I mean, this picture is not coming out clearly, but it had a scaly tail. It had uh, 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 claws which looked like uh, that of a bird. And it had teeth which were hollow, not mammalian teeth. And these teeth possibly had venom in them. And the jaw structure and the structure of the eye socket and all of those point that this had evolved only hair, which was a little different from reptiles. But every other feature it had was very reptilian. So basically, if you want to call your boss a snake, you know you won't be too far away. You know they are actually we've actually evolved from reptiles. But re but let me just also warn you: snakes were the last to evolve. They evolved only about 89 or 90 million years ago. They were the last among the reptiles to evolve. So, so this is what we are looking at here: is our ancestor. So, how if someone were to ask you, if a child or somebody was to ask you that, can you prove to me that we've evolved from you know, a reptile or a, or a fish, you know, because fish led to the evolution of the amphibians, the amphibians led to the evolution of the reptiles, you know, and so on. The reptiles to mammal-like reptiles like this creature, and from the mammal-like reptiles to mammals like us, right? But how is it that you can prove it? Now, there is a very interesting book called The Inner Fish, which actually talks to you about various pieces of anatomy in our body which matches that of the fish or the reptile or many other things. There's also a disease ecologist who has found that the genes that cause things like asthma and eczema is actually an overexpression of a gene that is actually normally expressed in a fish and cause scaliness. So there is a disease called ichthyosis. It's an extreme form of eczema. If you were to look at the genes of somebody who has ichthyosis and were to match it with that of a fish, both those genes would be expressed. That means they were all both switched on. In, in mammals, if they're switched on, that means they will give us the scaly skin. Okay? So a lot of your diseases are actually primitive. They're caused by something that existed in our deep ancestor. Psoriasis. Uh, ichthyosis. Psoriasis is another form. I mean, I mean based, it's not the same gene. Psoriasis is, uh, is an atopic disease. OK, let's come from 255 million to 251 million. Just 4 million years, something emerges in the deep seas. There is methane that was created from the deposition of those vegetation that was getting deposited, right? I mean, as you deposit vegetation in deep sea, it forms methane. Remember, we talk about methane from rice, right? I mean, rice beds have a lot of methane. It's exactly that phenomena. You have a deposit of 
uh, vegetation that's going into the sea. And what it does is there was volcanic activity in some parts of the seas, and this methane begins to get released rapidly. So Earth becomes really, really warm very quickly. And what it does is it creates the largest extinction that man's ever known, sorry, <coughs> Earth's ever known. What we know is that 95% of all creatures that lived in the sea and on the land perished. But a handful of creatures that survived are the ones that are the ones that live today as well. I mean, the ancestors of those. For example, the mammal-like reptile survived at this time and later became the mammal. And what happens within that period of 50 million years, the earth begins to recover, the forests begin to regreen the world, the, the inky seas have become blue again instead of maroon that were earlier. Look at India again. It's, it's begin to uh, you know, start to move northwards. And you have an ingress of sea, and now you start seeing an outline because some of these cracks have started to fill with a sea. There is. Which, which landmasses are what continents? I will show you. This, this is India. Okay, this is India. And okay. In the, can you go to the previous slide? Okay, this is India. Okay? It's exactly there. This is a clearer picture because it's only moved northwards. It will be much clearer here. This is India. This is America. Okay, this is South America, this is Africa, Madagascar, Antarctica, Australia, China, Russia, uh, Greenland is here, and Japan is yet to emerge. Japan is still sandwiched here. It's only partly outside just now. Europe, Europe is half of it under sea, half of it is outside. Denmark and Norway are possibly the oldest parts, like Iceland. They are the oldest parts of Sheila. Tethys will come now. It'll come around uh, between 110 million and 50 million. We'll come there. Just bear with me. I have one more question. There are different sciences. Let's take the questions later. Yeah. So one second. I'll just come back to them. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Where was I? <clears throat> okay. So India is trapped still here, but you know the outlines begin to happen because there are narrow seas that come come between land masses. Now look at this. There is something that happens here in South Africa. There is an island called the Bouvet Island. There's a massive explosion that happens here. It's just south of Cape Town, about 200 nautical miles dead south of, uh, of, uh, of Cape Town. And at Bouvet Island, we have this volcanic explosion which separates Antarctica from South, uh, South Africa, basically the African continent. And it also makes sure that India and Madagascar go in tow. So you have this creation of the of this big rift between the land masses. This becomes the Western Gondwana. And I mean, this is a term that uh, geologists and paleontologists have given. And there's something called the Eastern Gondwana. This is the time when Edward Swayze had coined this word for these two continents as uh, Western Gondwana, Eastern Gondwana. Now, stay with me, because this is going to be a rapid journey, how India begins to separate from all the land masses. Now, this is Bouvet Island. Remember, this is one of the islands very close to now where Antarctica is. Antarctica will come and wedge itself here, while Bouvet is going to be here. Now, we move about uh, 40 million years later, and we come to a place where we have another volcanic activity. Look at this, because this is exactly at the same uh, latitude. And this is the place where in people who know Bengal and, Be and Bihar, there's a district called the Raj Mahal. And there's a mountain range, a very small mountain range called the Raj Mahal mountains, beautiful pink granite and uh, basalt. Um, what happens here is this uh, Raj Mahal event causes, uh, again, a split between Australia and Antarctica and India. And this is where how it separates. So 100 million years ago, India, Sri Lanka, and Madagascar are liberated from all their neighbors, and we are free to move northwards. And this is the beginning of the creation of the Indian Ocean, right? These events are also very critical. Like each event leads to the creation of a new life form that did not exist earlier. This last event, about 105 to 100 million years ago, is the time when you see the, the emergence of the, the grasses. Until now, there were no grasses. And how do we get to know this? There is a, there's a very fine paper that was written in the Birbal Sahani Institute of Paleo Sciences where they looked at coprolite. It's a polite term for dinosaur shit, dinosaur dung. And they analyzed it. And they, for the first time, they found 
that they were uh, signatures of grass and grass braids. Okay? Until that paper, it was believed that all grasses had originated in China because the oldest fossil that was found from 76 million years ago was from China. But India has reset that argument because we now have fossil evidence, and that was the first, and since then we found several others. In the dinosaur dung, we found fossils of, uh, of grasses. Let's come to 88 million years ago. India is alongside Madagascar and Sri Lanka is sometimes underwater, sometimes out, out of it. And there's something called the Mondro Morondova uh, volcano, uh, which is e in the east part of uh, Madagascar here. And it leaves behind a trail of another small island, which is just west of Mangalore. Anybody here from Mangalore or Konkan side? They would know this beautiful island called St. Mary's Island, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful island. It's called the St. Mary's. And so part of Morondova's volcanic flow came with us and became the St. Mary's Island. It's a beautiful red basalt. It stands like tall pillars. And I, will, I don't have an image, but I sh I'm sure you will go there someday. Now, this is very critical for India. India is finally liberated from all the land masses, but there is, as it tries to move northwards because there is volcanic activity happening here, I want to just make this very clear. When I say land is moving, it's not that the land is moving. It's the sea that is spreading below. Land masses get shifted because there is sea mo there's movement under the sea. So when the tsunamis come in uh, you know, the Indian Ocean region, it's because new land is being created, the earthquakes are happening below, and there's new shifting happening below. And as a result of the shifting that is happening here first, that India is moving northwards, and then as India comes here, there's a big volcanic activity that happens here. And this is called the first episode of the Deccan volcano, uh, volcanoes that we see. And then a second episode, which is the biggest one, which, which is the one that creates Mahabaleshwar and Panjgani and Mathiran that we see from the train when we go from Pune to Bombay. You know, that's the, this is the event that, that event took place uh, in several spurts. The flow was huge. It created the Seychelles Island, the Reunion Island, and part of it also flew, uh, sorry, uh, spread across the eastern margins. It went as far as Rajamundri. So if you were to go to Rajamundri, you would see along the Godavari a long layer of black rock, which is very similar to the rock that you see in Mathiran. The Deccan lava flow would have looked something like this. It was not just massive volcanic flow, but it also had something that was simmering for a very long period of time. So it was building layer upon layer, layer upon layer, because lava would come from below. Remember the, the lava fountains that I talked to you about, the fire fountains? Something like that in the distance there. Look at this lovely uh, uh, pastel drawing by Doug Henderson. I wish I could have used it in my book, but I didn't get the permission. <laughs> You know, uh, you know, this is something which is, uh, you know, this is how it would have been bellowing for uh, this period of time. What the Deccan lava flow started doing for those four million years that they were releasing the gases was that it was killing the large trees and the palms and the areca nut palms and all those things on which the dinosaurs were feeding. And because the large trees and palms were getting extinct, the, the large dinosaurs began to die. And because the large dinosaurs began to die, the small dinosaurs, the, the predators, also began to die. But the final nail in the coffin was not the death of the dinosaurs and the extinction did not happen just because of the Deccan lava flow. It was because of that meteor that fell near Mexico. Right? That was the death knell for all the large creatures. So everything above 60 kgs died. Okay? Now, so this is for those of you who have not seen Mathiran or Mahabaleshwar. This is how the layer cake effect was created. You know, you've got layer upon layer being built over those three and a half million years. It looks beautiful if you see it in, uh, in the monsoons. But there are other explosive events that were happening around at the same time. And this is, uh, you know, there were eight such volcanoes between uh, Indore and Baroda. Seven of them got leveled out. There's only one remaining. And if you notice this bajri here, you know, the gravel, uh, this is, it was used to expand the roads and, you know, for the expansion of uh, the road, road, the national highways program. I think that's the political term for it. But, you know, this, something like this, this is a beautiful volcanic neck and you see it freeze. You know, the lava supply below got stopped for some reason. And it just, instead of flowing out, 
it just froze here and it created these large basalt pikes. And it looks beautiful. You would pay $20 to go and see it in America. In India, we don't even want to pay. I mean, this is a, this is, uh, it, it's an impediment for road making. So therefore, you're using it to make, uh, you know, bajri or gravel to, for road laying. So that's the travesty that we face. Uh, again, you see that beautiful uh, uh, basalt columns that you see. Something like this is what exists even in the uh, uh, St. Mary's Island, the ones I, would, I was telling you about. But this is about 20 million years younger than the St. Mary's. This is from the basalt of the Deccan lava flow. This is the road here. And for comparison's sake, here is a man with a red pagdi. Okay? So it's like half my digit. Look at this. Okay? And created in one single episode of lava flow. Isn't this beautiful? Of course, you see lava flow in Karwar and Goa. So if you never, next time you go to Goa, if you see a black rock like this, it's created by the lava flow coming out from, say, Bombay. The entire Bombay island that holds you know, that unique shape is because of the lava flow. It's dark gray. And if you see Sitla Mata Mandir or uh, even uh, the other station, I don't know how many, pe how many people are here from Bombay, but you know. <laughs> Yeah, so you know you would know Elphinstone College, for example, or Wilson College, the dark gray colleges. This is the rock that made it. Of course, you've got the famous, uh, you know, cave number 16 of Elora, the Kailash, which is gorgeous. I mean, the reason why it is so easy to hew this rock is because it's nice and soft, with very few uh, vacuole, vacuoles in it. So it's easy to cut through and doesn't uh, create uh, problems when you're etching out or hewing out rock. But this was the time when you know, the dinosaurs had died, and the entire space, the whole space for domination was open. Mammals were still small. It was the cousins of the dinosaurs that were still resting for power. So it was the giant birds and the land crocodiles. So mammals' time was still not, had not arrived yet. So it would still take them about 9 million years before they come to some size and start to dominate the whole scene. Now, I was coming to Tethys, that this is the time when Tethys comes. India's finally moved on. Madagascar's left behind. You remember Bouve Island here and Kerguelen Island here. Remember that thing that I told you about, where we separated India? And then, of course, the St. Mary's event that happened here. St. Mary's comes with us. Morondova stays here, right? Now, India's moving northwards because of the lava flows and the volcanic activity that's happening here. The creation of the Carlsberg Ridge, for those of you who are from Merchant Navy would know this. It's a very notorious part of the Indian Ocean. Very unpredictable currents here. And this is where the Carlsberg Ridge begins to, begins to form and continues to push India northwards. This is the Tethys Sea, starting from Shanghai, going right across here into the Mediterranean, which is still not formed fully, to Gibraltar. This ribbon-like structure has different types of landscapes. You've got lands that have come from the old Laurasian continent. You've got Western uh, Gondwana, and you've got Eastern Gondwana lands. You've got evolution happening in three different spaces of, uh, of, the, of the world, which are now coming together, joined together, together by this nice, warm, tropical sea. And this becomes a fascinating place for the evolution of a creature that we now know as the whales. And I'm going to show you an image of that. But what is critical at this time, like the grasses, this is the time when the evolution of the flowers is very, very critical for us. Flowers uh, offer to the small mammals, because they are large birds on the ground and land crocodiles, which are very vicious. The mammals are still on the trees, and they take to liking uh, things on, on trees. So there's pollen, there's nectar, and there's fruit. But what is also exciting for them is a bevy of beetles and flying insects and a lot of lizards. So from being very fruit and pollen-oriented creatures, these creatures begin to take a liking for meat and crunchy things like insects. But soon they become heavy. Now, another million uh, to two million years, they start to grow heavy. And they make frequent visits on the ground and start foraging on things, especially fruit, and insects and, and worms. Succulent worms in tropical uh, detritus are very, very attractive to creatures. And this is the time when you know, all these creatures come down and start to build, you know, start to lose uh, prehensile tails, which are used for climbing trees, develop longer limbs, 
they lo lose uh, you know, more of their webbing on the feet because they want to walk more on the ground. But what happens this time is that the divergence between creatures like this, what were once cousins, are now their predators. So they evolve in so many different ways that they are now eating one another. The cousins long removed are now sworn enemies. This is a reconstruction of a, uh, of a fascinating uh, fossil site that is uh, found along uh, the Cambe area. It's called the Vastan Mine. Uh, so paleontologists may not have, do not have to necessarily find great fossils, you know, entire fossils. Even a tooth is fine, uh, hair is good enough, and pollen. Pollen is a very, very good enduring thing. How does pollen survive? I mean, pollen is one of the hardiest things in, in nature because it is built with a silicaceous shell. It just does not get destroyed. And once it is trapped in sediment, you are able to reconstruct an entire forest. So after studying all the pollen studies that have happened in the Vastan lignite mine, we've been able to construct you know, the types of forest it would have been, the types of creature that lived there. So they found a bone of a tapir, and another large tapir uh, of a large uh, bird, land crocodile. But there's one mistake. We still haven't found a giant bird from India. So the artist made a mistake. But our assumption is that there must have been a giant bird in India as well. You know? And the reason is because the two, three neighboring countries that were around us, Madagascar, Australia, Antarctica, Antarctica was the, was the birthplace of the flightless birds. So if you notice, all the flightless birds that live in the world live in the southern hemisphere. Right? And so, uh, so the, the idea that uh, you know, uh, there were no mammals in, uh, in Antarctica that could challenge the, the, the ground-dwelling birds. OK, now the Tethys Sea has closed. And India has moved northward because of this powerful under, underwater engine, which is pushing the lands uh, further away. Notice that East Africa is also closing. Notice for the first time, there's ice in Antarctica. And also notice there is no Arctic yet. Antarctica is the more powerful engine for weather systems in the world even today. While we lament the loss of ice in the in Arctic region, remember it's the Antarctic that is more powerful in terms of determining the weather patterns of the world. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into a digression on climate change and those kind of issues, but uh, what also happens is that Tibet starts to get seasonal snow at this time. This is, like I said, the time when the whales were evolving. The whale, whales evolved from this creature. It was a mouse deer-like creature, small creature, that started liking, uh, take, uh, taking a liking to weeds and reeds and succulents that grew around ponds. And very, very gradually, a creature very similar to it started to duck underwater and start to, started to hunt crabs and other small creatures and started to make those visitations. A bit like otter, but not quite like an otter, but it, it was closely related to a wolf, but was called Indohyus. This creature, Indohyus means India's pig. When it was discovered, they thought it was a pig because its muzzle was small. It did not have canines like a dog or a wolf. But it was called Indohyus. It was wrongly named. But please notice that you know, the evolution is very rapid. Within uh, every half a million years, it evolves into something very, very different and, and becomes entirely aquatic and the largest living creature ever to have lived in the sea. It becomes the blue whale. Right? And look at the, tr the transition from starting from a small mouse deer, which is a quaking creature. It's so shy, all of that, you know, to being a majestic creature with possibly the most evolved <laughs> sense of communication and possibly empathy among uh, all living creatures today. I, an evidence of how uh, India and, uh, collided with Eurasia, or you know, as it collided with Tibet, here is sedimentary rock. This is the Indus, the Shok uh, tributary f uh, flowing through. And you notice that this part is India, this is the Tibet part, and this is the part which was sandwiched in between. This is the sea, the sediment from the sea that closed in. And if you were to go up right here, you would get fossils of fish and crabs and with consummities. Believe me, you would not have enough space in your backpack to get them. Okay? Because it's also high altitude, and I'm sure you would not like to pick them up. 
because it's extremely tiring taking them. OK, I'm now going to take uh, five minutes to uh, tell you what, how a typical journey of, uh, looks for me. I mean, while we travel in buses and trains and we look for different things, I plan my journey very differently. And this is a typical journey I do. It's one of my favorite journeys, traveling from Jodhpur to Jaisalmer. And I'm going to take, take you through two routes, first going via Ocean Falodi to uh, via Chandan. And there's a place called uh, Thayat here where we will stop. And then on our return, come back this way. Right? So let's begin the journey. We come to Jodhpur. Everybody knows Mehran Garh Fort. But it sits on a very beautiful rhyolite rock 750 million years ago, which, er which erupted 750 million years ago, and caused the defreezing of the Earth. So this is a very important rock in terms of evolution. Right? So this is how it looks. It's a volcanic rock. Remember the basalt rocks that I've been showing you? Nice and tall, they grow like this. Right? The single large columns like you know, volcanic rock has a char characteristic shape like this. And sometimes when the sandstone on top is heated, it gives this web-like pattern. So while I'm traveling, I'm also no looking for other rocks. I, and this is the map that I wanted to show you. Remember 750 million years ago, India is in the north here. Greenland is still a tropical paradise, although India is still sandwiched with uh, Australia, Antarctica, and all other uh, uh, land masses. Antarctica, so it's going to be a bit of a ballroom dancing that's going to happen. You remember the 250 million year image that I had shown you? India was here and Antarctica was here. That's because that rotation was to yet to happen. You know, that ballroom movement was yet to happen. That pivoting, that, that, that rotation from the center was yet to happen of all the land masses. So I've gone back 500 million years. Please don't get confused with the image that I showed you first where India was here, trapped under ice. India is here 500 million years earlier. But remember, Greenland is still a tropical paradise. Right? And India is still trapped in snow. And that, that's the point that I'm trying to show you, that you know, somewhere here, when, near Jodhpur, where Jodhpur would have been somewhere here, this Malani um, event would have happened, this one, which caused the uh, creation of the rhyolite, which melted all the ice here, and caused the defreezing of. So it was a massive, massive event to cause the defreezing of all of Earth. I come across a bed. Uh, which is not marked on the map. I go with geological maps, which are on my phone. Uh, but when I look at it and I say, there's no sedimentary rock here, so what's this? And I discover that this is a fish bed. And there's so much fish in this. It's, it's again, very difficult because I'm traveling in a small Indica car, and I can't put, <laughs> put so much fossil. And this, they, not only do I find crabs and eels, and you know, it's, it's gorgeous. I mean, I, I imagine that this is a late Jurassic, early Cretaceous, which is about 120 to uh, 70 million years uh, in age. But very, very easy for us to spot it. It's right next to the highway, about 800 meters off the highway. Uh, I come to a place which is an abandoned uh, uh, phosphorus mine. Notice that this is a stromatolite. Remember the layered cake that, uh, sorry, the layered uh, creature that I talked to you about, which released all the oxygen on the Earth? Well, this is that. Okay? For, a, for somebody who has, uh, you know, uh, followed paleontologists and geologists for 22 years, it's now become relatively easy for me to spot a, a stromatolite. And it's, this is an abandoned mine because uh, the geologists uh, who wanted to extract, or, or the company that was extracting this, had taken out whatever was economically feasible and has left the, the rest of it behind. Where is this? Uh, this is the, just short of Falodi. Just short of Falodi, on the east side of Falodi. I come to, uh, so this is that creature that I was telling you. Of course, this is from Sonbhadra, but you remember the stromatolite I was telling you about? Just for your refreshing your memory, this is the cre creature that I was telling you about. I come across the same site in the same fossil be in the same uh, phosphorus belt. I come here again. I find these nail-like structures on a rock, and this is a telltale sign of a worm fossil. It's not a fossil of the worm, but the tunnels that the worms create. We can't find entire fossils of worms because it's very very difficult to get soft-bodied creatures getting fossilized. They would decompose, right? So, but what we get in terms of uh, fossils is the burrows and the holes that they make. So you can see these. And there's another one here. OK, when you're picking up fossils, uh, looking for fossils, be careful. You can find um, uh, scorpions. This is a baby scorpion. It's not a big one. But uh, and nevertheless, the, st the sting is quite uh, potent to kill anyone if you don't get medical attention. Uh, what is interesting about, for, uh, about scorpions is that they were among the earliest creatures to have 
left the sea and taken to land. The transition from uh, sea to land was by creatures like the, uh, these, uh, these scorpions. Much before the amphibians. Sorry? Much before, Much before the amphibians, yeah. I mean, these creatures came at about 585 million years ago. <clears throat> now, this is another beautiful rock. Uh, it's a granite with a bit of sandstone. Again, just west of, uh, uh, northwest of Falodi. I come to another abandoned mine. Again, this is, if you notice the yellow, this is a telltale sign of phosphorus. You find an iron washing that happens on phosphorus, which gives a lovely pinkish color. And notice these shelly creatures here. They are, again, very primitive shelly creatures from early Jurassic. Early Jurassic, what I mean when I say early Jurassic, it should be about 180, 170 million years ago. Sorry. Whoops, what did I do? So, OK. Um, road cuts are very exciting to watch. I mean, freshly made roads uh, offer cross sections of the earth, although um, it's not desirable to see lots of road construction. But sometimes, I mean, there are collateral benefits. I mean, you get to see uh, cross sections like this. Um, you see, uh, you know, deposition of calcareous soil like this. The deposition of calcium or, ca you know, calcium carbonate or, or limestone in this case is a good sign to not only for finding fossils in them, but also shows at this time the Earth had a very vibrant ecosystem which was collecting all the carbon from the air and depositing it. So it was time of when much of the Earth was tropical. So that's the telltale sign of finding a, a, a space like this. And we know that India was somewhere in the mid-latitudes. So that's the beauty of finding something like this cross-section. I come to Falodi. Now, Falodi is a very important site in terms of uh, uh, looking at rocks. Now, this is the place which I actually wanted to go. Um, you notice the rocks here are slightly rounded. And you find these channels, which I have you know, some, uh, and I mean, I was blessed with some rain at this time when I went there. So you see some pools of water, which is very unlike a desert condition, you know, a hot desert condition. But notice that you have rocks embedded even within sedimentary rock. Notice here. Now, this is something very unique. I remember the time when I told you that 255 million years ago, India was trapped under ice. This is the time when we have a, a telltale sign on land to show us that there, was, uh, I, there were icebergs and glaciers that were floating in North India. How do I know that? This is typically a sign of uh, a glacier. As a glacier moves, it takes with it uh, a rock and it rounds it up. Because under pressure, there's a huge amount of ice, and there's rock, and there's, a, there's solid ground on, the, on, the, on, on its base. And as it moves very slowly, there's a little bit of water that is rubbing through it. And it tends to erode and shape these rocks into rounded forms. And as it goes and drops these rocks, as it enters a shallow sea, they get deposited in fine mud. And you find them, therefore, embedded in these muddy rocks. right? Of course, because these channels got created, many of these rocks were displaced. But you still see that these rocks are embedded here, for example. Right? Let me show you another rock. So these are beautiful pools. There's only aesthetic reasons I've brought this. But here's another example. You see uh, a rock which has got marks of water ripples that has just moved across. It was, some, it was a rock that was carried by the glacier. And the movement of the glacier has etched these watermarks on top of it. I come to this village called Thayyad. This is just about 8 to 10 kilometers short of reaching uh, Jaisalmer. And this uh, uh, Dhabawala has made it big because um, geologists from the world over wanted to come and see something which was very unique and was not seen in very many parts of India. And the reason why they came here and you know gave him so much business that he started a fancy Dhaba is this. Now, I don't know whether you can see this. You can see this trident-shaped thing here. And this is a footprint of a dinosaur. Okay? And this is a bed from the Jurassic times. So we know that this is 188 million years old. And this is the creature that would have possibly been roaming around. It's a beach comber. It's looking for anything that the sea has left behind. It's trying to f catch a frog or a, or a, or a creature that, that lagoonal space has left. It left footprints here, and that's something that got preserved. The characteristic rock of Jaisalmer, I don't think I need to tell historians like you, but this is the golden city is created by this beautiful rock called the Abur sandstone. Right? And you can see these squiggly bits here, which look like 
uh, Arabic or Urdu calligraphy. These are basically shells. And you know, this kind of lagoonal environment, you know, bases here would have been the place where the sedimentary rock was formed. And you have this beautiful golden color from the potassium. Remember the potassium mine where I was looking at stromatolite and I then discovered the scorpion? All that washing that came from there is lending this color of yellow, that bit of potassium, but largely calcium carbonate. Right? Now, let's come back to Tethys, right? Now, we, you remember we were here, I told you that from Shanghai to Gibraltar, you've got the Tethys. There's one place. Hmm. I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll tell you about it. One, just let me finish this. I'll, I'll talk about. It. <clears throat> okay. So this is the like. I mean, this was the place where you know you had a lot of movement of landforms, and you have deposition of calcareous rock. And what I am interested in is one calcareous rock, which is this. It's Multani Mitti, Fuller's Earth, right? I think all men and women know it now. And you know, when, when you pull out Multani Mitti, it's a fascinating place to go to. I would urge everybody to go to Bothia or Kapudi or you know, which is just southwest of uh, of Jaisalmer. Um, people work in appalling conditions. Let me say that also. I mean, they have severe lung problems and blindness, premature blindness because of that. Silicosis. Yeah, I mean, it's a form. It's it's a form of silicosis, but there's no silica in this. That's a problem. This is this is calcareous, and uh, there's no silica in it. So. While they're drying the stone, because it's wet, okay, when you take out uh, these slabs, yeah. And this is the mine owner, Ahmed Bhai. And I find uh, in this, uh, in, in the Fuller's Earth, you get this fossil. Okay, this looks like, it, it is a fossil, right? I hope you recognize this. This is a sita phal, what you call sharifa, a custard apple. Now, custard apple was reintroduced into India in the 17th century by the Portuguese. But if you were to look at geological records, it was there in India, got extinct, and got isolated and lived in Central America. It was only later was it reintroduced, and now Hyderabad's famous and Kolhapur's famous Sita Phals are actually from there. So a lot of crops, for example, potato, tomato, chilies, all of those were historically possibly present in India, and they got extinct, but are now found only in South America. Right? I come across an entire coconut. Look at this. I show you. A a blow up. If you notice, you actually can she see each hair, each resha, right? It's gorgeous. But again, it's very fragile because it's wet, and as soon as it starts to dry, it'll start peeling off. So you have to put some acrylic binder on top to keep it preserved. I come across this beautiful fungus. It's very rare. And I was told by a mycologist, uh, mycologists are people who study fungi and mushrooms, that this is extremely rare and seen not so often. OK, now I'm going to take five minutes. I know Manisha is giving me the looks. I need to end my talk. I can go on uh, at geological pace. But you know, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, about uh, uh, how, do, how does popular culture, how has it seen, say, something as representative uh, uh, of, uh, yeah, I know. Everybody wants to go home. Yeah, I know. I get the sign. I get the sign. OK, so I'll be quick. So how does popular culture show uh, dinosaurs? now? This is a Bengali magazine, and it shows creatures like this sitting in a swamp. Now, we know it from the 1960s. In the 60s, it was very clear that dinosaurs like these creatures, because you know, uh, anatomists were trying to say that you know, how could such a heavy creature with such a long neck survive on land? It therefore could only live in water. So it became a misconception in the late uh, 1880s, 1890s, when they were discovering the sauropod skeletons, that this creature would have lived in swampy conditions. And these creatures, the, the terrible lizards, the Tyrannosaurus and others, would come and feast on them. Well, that is completely wrong, because now they have got a correct posture. And in fact, had they been living in swamps, they would actually get trapped and would not be able to leave and die there. They would actually sink, right? Because of the weight and not being able to pull their feet up. Again, Motu Patlu and Motu Chotu are, uh, you know, you know, use a dinosaur to invade an uh, alien land. Uh, again, Ankylosaurus and, uh, you know, one of my least favorite films. I mean, I would urge you not to watch it. I suffered. I actually suffered. And, you know, if Intact can pull it off, please pull it off. This is Dara Singh and I think one of the early films of Mumtaz. Uh, but, you know, they have, and they say in this film, wo dekho dinosaur. Or one of the uh, 
प्रिंसेस आस्क डायनासोर क्या होता है भयानक छिपकली विच अगेन भयानक छिपकली इज यूज इन जुरासिक पार्क वन वेन इट गॉट ट्रांसलेटेड इन टू हिंदी यू नो द फर्स्ट टाइम दे शो डायनासोर इन इन जुरासिक पार्क it it actually says wo dekho bhayanak chipkali you know it's exactly sounds like 1964 of course that was 1994 but or 96 was it jurassic park 1 yeah okay so this is a creature i suffered i'm just trying to show you that i actually saw the film right okay uh, two years later there's another creature which invades uh, bombay this is i think khosrobag if i'm not mistaken for those who are from bombay might know this uh, but you know we are repeating that mistake over and over again right we've got you know there's no you know this this is a recent film and i'm i mean i'm not trying to uh, you know i mean i'm not trying to sorry i'm not trying to say anything to the bengalis but you know a creature of this kind i mean first of all you take you know dinosaurian actors but you know that would be an insult to dinosaurs because dinosaurs are the most successful vertebrates ever to have lived so i think whenever that's true actually because dinosaurs ruled the world there are no creatures like them that have ever existed even the mammals failed to be the way the dinosaurs were fantastic large and from being chicken size to being monstrous you know huge right we each year we find new varieties of dinosaurs that are beating uh, you know beating up the size ratio and it's just <laughs> bewildering the size that we find but coming back to this you know what is the, what is terrible about this is that they show a tropical forest in which this creature lives my problem with this is and they call it a dinosaur in the film now what the problem is that if you live in a in a tropical forest you will need in a creature of this size if it needs to feed itself it will need at least 20 elephants or something of that size right or and how if you're running in a in a jungle how are you going to not get attached or or get uh, caught in a tree you know and you've got spikes all over and look at this it is so inefficient to have a mouth like this you if you were a deep sea living creature it is fine a viper fish and you know the dragon fish and those kind of creatures which have extra long teeth but that's because they are largely macro feeders they're not uh, feeders of this kind so there is a problem in the way we actually envisage the milieu in which a film is set of the way we design our films and making it slightly more believable because this creature although is fantastic but it is absolutely ludicrous okay now i i want two more minutes to pontificate uh, since i've got the audience you know i think why do i read uh, uh, natural history or why do i study natural history i think uh, for me it is important to understand uh, what is the perspective why is it that delhi is more affected by crop burning than say chandigarh why is the aqi better in delhi in sorry chandigarh than you know the answer is because the landforms are designed in that way right or why is merit worse than delhi right so the answers are because there are some things in the landforms and the way the wind currents move and i think all of that has been decided for us by geology or some things that happened in the past right so for me that perspective is important i think it can answer a lot of our questions and a lot of our answers <clears throat> i think it also builds in a sense of humility because if you don't find value in a hill or a or a rock or a stream i don't think it's going to bring in humility in terms of our understanding of the nature the importance of several landforms and landscapes so i think that's very important and i think if people want to forecast things in the future this is something which is very important i don't think we can see very well in the future because given that we are uh, you know disrespecting the environment the way we are i don't think this is the case as of now and i think if we really want to do something we now need to have to start going deeper into the earth and understand what happened in deep time as well okay uh things that we can do and i think i'm uh, standing in a seat of learning i can't talk to you more about what we need to do here but i think what we have failed to do in terms of our education is that we don't have critical thinking or the ability to let children ask questions so i don't think we let our children stay curious we don't encourage question and question and answers and we don't need to uh, you know really go by the road and i think everybody's been talking about it right i mean stop the road stop the road but you know what is the way out i don't have the answer but i think question and answers and going deeper into the questions is possibly the way out the second thing we must do is try finding new solutions to problems that are new as well as old because they might be common answers to many of them 
my my take on climate change is very different and i'm actually shunned in meetings now after my book has come out and people who've read my book carefully and i think only eight or nine people have actually <laughs> read that part you know there's a footnote that i've written which i have actually criticized the way climate change is working now my my submission is very simple and i'll say it in 30 seconds if all the coal and the petrol is coming from deep earth okay it's coming from very deep earth you know several miles below and we release it in the air and we say we are going to plant trees which are going to be stay on the surface we are not packing back things back into the deep earth so how are you going to control the total amount of carbon that is going to stay on the surface our challenge is that that carbon is going to burn whether it's going to burn in the Californian wildfires or in Australia, it's going to get released, or the biomass that we work in, burn in India, right? The challenge is we need to pack it back there, and how are we going to do that? Because if you're going to put all your carbon up there, it's going to keep, keep cat catching fire. That's the trait of carbon. Nobody wants to talk about packing carbon. Everybody wants you to do, whether it's an oil company or whoever, will encourage you to plant trees. That's not going to work. It's a very good Band-Aid, but you need surgery. Okay? That's my two bit. I do a lo longer presentation on this, but if anybody's interested, I'm happy to do that. The final thing is, I think we need more museums. You know, if it's such a deep, rich country, if we've got Deccan, we've got, you know, the, we've got the Ganga, which is a fascinating story. Um, we've got the Pork Straits. We've got the Andamans. There's no museum on the Andamans. I would like to do a museum on the natural history of Delhi. Uh, natural history of Chennai, natural history of Bombay, you know, explain what happened in those five or seven uh, million years when crocodiles and turtles and everything used to live there and dinosaurs used to live in Bombay, but got buried under the, the, the lava and then they died again, right? So isn't that, that a fascinating story? Can't there be local small stories that we need to tell people that the land you stand on is very important? Because if you don't know the story, you're not going to respect it, right? So thank you so much, and uh, enjoy your weekend. Okay. Okay. So I think it is subconscious because that. Uh, that pressure, that influence of geology is there, right? We don't recognize it. Nature itself has predisposed, oops, sorry, has, has given a certain kind of feature to landforms or whatever, right? I mean, there are seasons, there are uh, water current, air currents, wind systems, whatever. All of those can be understood by this subconscious thing that we don't recognize. It is subconscious because it's behind uh, behind our mind for two reasons. One, we don't consider geology or geologists or people who study deep time in any of the policy making that we do. So they are subconsciously there, we invest in them, but we don't ask them to invest their energies in policy making or defining what is the reason for a current problem. So that's one subconscious. And of course, like I said, there is, you know, the every, the, every effort that we make in terms of, uh, you know, whether it's planting a tree or you know, interlinking or rivers, any of those ludicrous ideas. Uh, you know, there has to be an understanding of what happened in deep past. Whether they're soils, we need to understand what soils, what are the rocks, where is the groundwater. We don't go that far. You know? And I think that's where we need to start understanding that there is a need to understand that the role that rocks and uh, past events have played. And that's the reason why it's subconscious. I want them to be very conscious Made, be made part of conscious policy making. Thank you for asking that question. That was a good question. Um, I have two yeah. questions. Oh, where are, where, okay, ma'am. Okay, sorry. One is, uh, did you ever look at uh, Velikovsky and his books, you know, Worlds in Collision? Because he says Nafta came from the heavens. Yes. And this mana that came and uh, these people survived on right. then because he relates that to the things like Correct. that. And he says that's why they say in the old Hebrew Old Testament that uh, the rivers burned with fire because the naphtha naturally took the root of the rivers. Yes. That's the second question. The second question is this banded iron formation. Yes. You were talking of Shakti Sthal, yes. which is from Orissa. 
Yes. But Shivpuri has vast areas of banded iron formation. Yes, Shivpuri and that, has that, isn't yeah. that the source of life? Source that of is life? the beginning of life no. due to oxygen. No. Um, so now the oldest recorded life that is, uh, you know, there are now contentious fossils. There's one from the Vindians, but from the Son Valley. Shivpuri ones are much younger. I mean, in fact, they, they would fall in the, not even in the top 10 of India and possibly not in the globe at all in that list. Um, so the Shivpuri ones, are the banded iron are chert. The one that you see in, uh, in the one in Shaktisthal, that beautiful Orisha. rock, that's from Odisha. And it's in my book as well, if you see. Yeah, so it's there in my book. So that's and sorry, uh, that's part. That's, that's that's a banded chert. iron. That's but not what chert. What is the? That's not banded. That's, that's that's not no jasper is pure red. That's not jasper. So banded iron will be a uh, strawberry uh, colored one with the black strawberry and black. So it's ferric oxide, ferrous oxide, ferrous, ferric oxide, ferrous oxide. And is the Narmada Rift Valley? It used to be, but it got not closed active. Off. Not active. No, not anymore. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh hey. Okay, right, okay. Go okay. Ahead. Regarding that phosphate uh, mountain you say, can it be, I mean, farmed by humans? Yes, it surely can be planted because it's nice and rich. And can we do it on Mars? I mean, because it released. <laughs> See, uh, Mars has a couple of other problems. See, one of the things about Mars is that it doesn't have an active core like ours, right? So that's the first problem with Mars. There are high winds. And there are bursts of methane, which are different, right? I mean, so we are still understanding the atmosphere and the soil content of Mars. And there's no definitive record of microbes surviving in, you know, so the soil samples that have, you know, that will come back will inform us whether we can culture anything out of those soils. So we don't have any. What we have is some proof that there are possible landscapes created by some microbes, but that's, you know, it's only by looking at a photograph. Till we don't have a culture, we don't have anything. We need to be able to isolate it. Thanks. Yeah, OK. This gentleman here first. Yeah, uh, you said that basalt helps in formation of water. Yes. Yeah, uh, can you just please explain that? OK, so um, what happened is that, you know, this, uh, you know, the time when uh, volcanic uh, ash was coming out and, you know, the basalt was coming out, you had meteorites coming from uh, from space as well. So meteors were bringing in water vapor. That's a fact. The other thing that was happening is basalt by itself releases hydrogen sulfide, methane, and olivine, and perodite, and many other uh, minerals on top. And as it does that, it, it creates an opportunity for hydrogen to liberate and oxygen to combine. For example, if you were to look at uh, the uh, the images from Iceland, you know that massive ex uh, volcanic activity that happened six years ago. Uh, notice the amount of vapor from even from the space image. It's not from the clouds itself. You can notice that it is happening because of the mineral circulation. The very nice paper in Scientific American. If you if you're interested, I can send it to you. I yeah. I sorry, ma'am. There's no sorry. Sorry, ma'am. That lady behind. Sorry. Uh, the continent Lemuria, right? The, it's a myth or real? It's a myth. I mean, there's no evidence yet. I mean, the only other new microcontinent that has been discovered is one called New Z uh, Zealandia, which is off New Zealand. That was discovered last year. Lemuria has been pushed by a lot of Tamil scholars. Uh, it is a convenient theory, but it does not exist. Sorry. I mean, there have been some artifacts that have been found from the deep sea, but that could be from a ship or anything else. Geologically, there's no evidence of a shelf or a land that has collapsed. And you know, those telltale signs of land collapsing are not there. And Zealandia is underwater. Zealandia is still underwater. Yeah, the shelf is yeah, absorbed. In the Antarctic piece, yes. Yeah, on the Tasman Sea. I just wanted to. No, I mean, that's a different chip of the block. I mean, there's a rift between Zealandia and the New Zealand. So, uh, I mean, if you're asking me about the mythological content, although it's not your turn, I will answer. I'll come back to you, OK? I'm out of Yes, you are, OK. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. OK. So basically, it's just a trail. And you see it everywhere. If you see Macau Islands, right? So you notice that there are land bridges that have been, though it's not created by humans. I mean, there's several. Bering Strait, for example. There are sunken islands, some uh, tops that have got you know, highlighted on top. So it's just 
coincidental that they are, you know, they kind of validate something that we want to believe in. So is there any proof of the city of Dwarka? There is uh, a city that is submerged. You want to call it Dwarka, great. I don't know whether people 3,200 years would like to call it that. I don't know. I think you should ask people at Intac. I'm not a history person. I mean, I, I, I don't have the most recent understanding on the history. But if you want to know how that uh, place sunk, I can tell you. But since that's not your question, I'm not answering it. So I'll come to you. <laughs> Sorry. I, Sorry. I just Sorry. 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 wanted to know, I mean, I saw a dramatic fault line in Ladakh where yes. the tectonic yes. plates said. Yes. Are there more such in India? Oh, several. There are several. Uh, you go from Chandigarh to, uh, to Shimla, you will cross a place called Manot. It's a very small village. And if you were to... So there is, I mean, there's an advantage. You know, they, they've made this raised uh, road going towards Shimla. If you were to get down on that busy bridge and stand up on the parapet, which I would not advise you to do, you can actually see it. And in fact, it's best to see it on Google Maps. Google Maps gives it to you very beautifully. A village called Manot, which actually shows you that rifting. A small minor rift, but it's uh, about a few, uh, it's about, no, it's not growing. It's about being stable. It's about uh, 100 meters wide, and it goes for a sizable distance. Uh, there was a hand. OK, sir. Why did Dwarka sing? So uh, there is, OK. Um, OK, uh, I would, OK, I'm going to be very curt on this. There's something called the Allah Band. Have you heard of it? Allah Band, yeah. It's a major tectonic uh, shift that happened. The last time Allah Band became active was in 1884. I wasn't alive, but yeah, 1884 or some such time. That was the last time. Allah Band. Allah, as in Allah, B-U-N-D. Just Google it. You'll find it. Yeah, it's it's quite an interesting page. The, the wiki page is good, actually. They've done a good job. I was just curious about the Bohemian language. I know. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little lost on that. I don't know whether it's true. I don't know whether it yeah, exists. It could happen because, you know, uh, Earth moves its North Pole and South Pole every year. So if you go to, say, you know, if you ask a pilot, for example, or, a nav or, a, or a somebody who works in the airline industry, they will tell you they come up with <coughs> recalibrated maps every year because the pole moves, you know, and it moves. Yeah, so there is a dipole movement also, right, the magnetic movement. So I still can't understand that if Bermuda Triangle exists on one side, why is it not on the Antipodes, right, on the other side? It should exist on the Polynesia or Melanesia side, and it does not. So because there are no reported missing ships during World War II from that time, so because there were so many ships crossing, you know, the Japanese and the Americans and the planes were flying, why did they not sink, you know, go missing, like Mary Celeste or, you know, those ships that went missing? So. Okay. Is it true that the majority of the water in the ocean was deposited by comets? Yes. Year? Yes. yes. So see. there's a paper that came day before. In fact, it's on Google News. Just look at, if you type water, meteor, Europa, and you will find it. So the tails of comets are actually water. Water. Water, water vapor. So why did they hit the Earth at that point of time and not now? Well, uh, like I said, Earth was in a state of chaos. You know, the, uh, I mean, the orbital cycles were all, you know, in a mismatch. And, and there was no atmosphere. No, I mean, they would, they would burn off now, but, you know, that's the other thing. Yeah. The atmosphere tends to burn the smaller particles, but, you know, why not a large one? That's his question. That's a fair point. So there was a, the last big one, I think, was the Tungasha one, that, the one that fell in uh, Siberia, 1944, 46. Yeah, 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 they just flattened all the forest. But it was, again, very, very tiny in comparison to what has already hit Earth. For example, I would urge you to take a trip to Dhala because it's a beautiful place. It's unspoiled by nature. Even the trek is beautiful. This place called Dhala in Shivpuri, I showed that image. It's, it's very pretty. It's very beautiful. And do some rock collection there. Collect some rock. Not for your farmhouse and all that, because that would be a pillaging, but just take small pieces. Be respectful. And it's the difference of the salt in the ocean? It does. I mean, the, not the seas that when they formed were like water, but the buildup of salt has been a very, very gradual process. It's a very gradual process, and the salinity has increased over time. But why? Due to the comics? No, no, no. It's because of the land, the land sediments flowing in and flowing out. So it's a, it's a complex reaction between um, the sediments of, the, of land and concentration of sodium. And the last question. OK. Last question. <laughs> Who would you pick? Uh. I would take that lady because she's got a hand for some time. Yeah, please go ahead. 
Yeah, you need to call me at a place where nobody will fling a chappal or something. Because the last time I did it, there were some people... Is it? Yeah. Well, I've been harangued in Mangalore, uh, Bangalore and Pune. So, and, yeah. <laughs> well, I would be careful. <laughs> no, no, no. I would no, I wouldn't say that. I think there were elements who were. Sure. I mean, I, I would love to do a talk on how geology has impacted history. So, yeah. History. Well, we have to. All good things come to an end, and we have to close this. So we have a small token of appreciation for uh, Pranay, and may I request Manu Bhatnagar, who's principal director of our Natural Heritage Division, to please hand it to him, since he was the one who put me in Thank touch you. with uh, Pranay. He's saying the most sweet. And thank you, Pranay, for uh, taking time out from your very, very busy schedule no, and coming boy. to us. I kept uh, Manisha not waiting for too long. I'm so sorry. One year. That's not long. <laughs> Hopefully, next time it will be much less. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. uh, my thanks, as always, to our back-end team and to Alia for handling the publicity creatives. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Please join us for a cup of tea outside. Thank you so much.